Hello, this is Robert de Graaf and welcome to another video on the basics of NMR. Today we'll talk about RF pulses. This is the pulse sequence that we're most familiar with. It's the pulse acquire sequence, having three periods, a preparation phase in which the magnetization is built up along the z-axis, then the excitation pulse uh, transforms that into transverse magnetization that are, is then acquired during the acquisition part. Now if this angle alpha equals 90 degree, then the pulse is referred to as an excitation pulse, exciting the magnetization from Z to XY. If alpha is 180 degree, then it's called an inversion pulse, inverting the magnetization from plus Z to minus Z. If the magnetization is already in the XY plane, then the 180 degree pulse is referred to as a refocusing pulse, inverting one of the two components in the transverse plane, leading to a spin echo. Now, there are literally hundreds of different RF pulses, and they can be grouped in a number of categories, as shown here. In the first category, we have the most commonly used ones, including square and shaped RF pulses. The second category includes adiabatic RF pulses. The third one as well, but also multidimensional and spectrospatial pulses, and has a whole bunch of modifications. For today's video, we'll focus only on square or hard RF pulses. The next video will focus on shaped RF pulses, and a third video <coughs> will discuss the more advanced adiabatic and other RF pulses. Before we talk about uh, NMR, it's uh, informative to look at excitation in other forms of spectroscopy, for example infrared spectroscopy, where one studies uh, different vibrational modes. So with a given vibrational mode, there is an, a discrete energy level associated with that. And a different vibrational mode is a discrete higher level, higher energy level um, associated with that. Now we can study this system by bridging the energy level difference, delta E, with um, a frequency that matches exactly this delta E. In this case, it would be frequencies in the infrared uh, part of the spectrum. Now we can bring uh, the, the system from a lower energy level to a higher energy level uh, through absorption of electromagnetic waves. Or we can go the other way around where we emit an, um, uh, an electromagnetic wave that we can detect. Now, NMR spectroscopy can also be described in terms of discrete energy levels. In the upper higher energy level, the nuclear spins are anti-parallel to the B0 field the so-called beta state, um, and whereas when these spins are parallel to B0, or the alpha spin state, they're in a discrete lower energy level state. There is an energy level difference, and therefore you can bridge that energy level difference with appropriate frequencies, which for NMR lie in the radio frequency, or hundreds of megahertz range. So this is in principle possible, however, NMR Practical NMR isn't done this way. We're not using electromagnetic waves. So this uh, picture is convenient for, for many to explain many things of NMR, but it is not a great analogy uh, for um, RF pulses. So how do we achieve um, excitation in NMR? Well, from an earlier video, you may recall that the magnetization that we're trying to detect is along the z-axis, and it is uh, the sum of many, many, many nuclear spins that are all rotating at a Larmor frequency. In order to rotate the magnetization to the XY plane, we need a secondary magnetic field B1 that rotates also at a Larmor frequency and is perpendicular to the magnetization. If that is true, then the magnetization experiences a rotational force or a torque, and when the, uh, when the, uh, the nutation angle alpha is adjusted to be 90 degrees, we're getting full excitation of our magnetization. So, uh, the coherent rotation of the magnetization requires a magnetic field B1 that is perpendicular to M0, and this ultimately dictates the orientation of the radio frequency coil that will produce the radio frequency pulses, and it requires the B1 field to be in resonance with the Lamo frequency of the spins. In other words, B1 is a magnetic field that rotates at the Lamo frequency. 
So ideally, we want a magnetic field, B1, that rotates like this. In this case, it rotates clockwise. Mathematically, it can be described by this equation, which is equal to this equation. And what this means is that on the x-axis, you need to feed in a cosine modulated frequency, whereas on the y-axis, you need to feed in a sinusoidally modulated frequency. Now, this is possible with so-called quadrature transmission, but this is not the simplest way, this is not the most common way of generating a B1 field. A more common way is to only use a cosine modulated frequency along one axis. Oops. That will look like this. Well, this clearly doesn't look like the rotating B1 field that we want to have. However, mathematically, a cosine function can be described as a complex exponential with the frequency that we want, plus a complex exponential with a negative of that frequency. In other words, this cosine modulated frequency is really composed of two frequencies, one rotating clockwise, one rotating anti-clockwise. The clockwise blue vector is the one that we want, that's the same as in this first picture. The anti-clockwise rotating component is extremely far off resonant and doesn't really affect our nuclear spin, and we can basically ignore that. So you can see that a cosine modulated frequency does equal a rotating uh, B1 field. Okay, so now let's have a look at the simplest um, RF pulse, which is so-called square RF pulse. Square RF pulse is off most of the time, but at some point you turn it on on to a maximum amplitude, B1 max, leave it on at that amplitude and then turn it off again at, uh, uh, at the end of the pulse length T. Now the flip angle that this pulse achieves is given by 360 degrees times the amplitude in Hertz times the duration in seconds. Very simple equation. Now some people don't like using B1 in Hertz. You can also convert it to B1 in Tesla or my Tesla by basically inserting the gyromagnetic ratio in front of it. Um, and so these equations are equivalent. <coughs> and let's run some numbers through it, through it. So let's say we have a maximum B1 of 1000 Hz, which equals 23.5 micro Tesla for protons using this conversion here. If we want to now have an excitation uh, of 90 degrees, then using either one of these equations, you can calculate that the duration of the pulse needs to be 250 microseconds. And so uh, these two equations give you a good handle on amplitude versus duration. Now, before we move on, it is important to realize that this black line is only the envelope function of the square pulse. The square pulse itself is of course applied at the Lamo frequency, and the Lamo frequency is typically between a few megahertz to several hundred megahertz. So there is always a frequency modulation that is part of this, but most publications only show the envelope function shown in black. But always be aware that it is actually a high frequency uh, RF pulse. Okay, so now we need to talk about rotating frames. So uh, let's say that we add a, a magnetic field of 3 Tesla, which then corresponds to a Lamor frequency of about 128 megahertz. So let's say that we consider the pulse on the pre from the previous slide that had a duration of 250 microseconds. In that time, the spins uh, revolved 32,000 times around B0, but they only revolve 90 degrees or a quarter of a revolution around B1. So if you visualize that, you get something like this, where the magnetization is in red along the z-axis, and the B1 is a yellow, and the B1 will of course rotate at a Lamo frequency. As soon as the magnetization is tipped away from the z-axis, it also starts to rotate around B0, which is along the z-axis. And at the end of the uh, RF pulse, you can see that you have achieved full excitation, the magnetization is in the xy plane, but it comes at a very, very complicated motion. Now, this motion, where the magnetization rotates around the B0 field, that always happens, and so that is not so interesting to visualize it all the time. So to get rid of that motion, uh, one can go to a so-called rotating frame. In a rotating frame, the frame, the blue frame, is rotating at the same frequency as the RF pulse. So you will see 
that the yellow vector will stay along the x-axis at all times. You, the observer, is still sitting in the laboratory or non-rotating frame. So you can see here that the B1 field is indeed constant along the x-axis and the entire frame is rotating but you as the observer are still sitting in the non-rotating frame and so you haven't really achieved anything yet. Things will get a lot easier if you, the observer, is now going to sit inside the rotating frame, right there at the end of the B1 field vector. Then you're ro rotating with the B1 field and therefore that rotation is no longer visible to you. And you're going to get this very simple rotation where the magnetization simply rotates around the B1 field uh, and, and it, get, it's, it gets fully excited as you can see here. So basically every RF pulse that we're going to discuss from here on out uh, is always going to be visualized in a rotating frame because motions uh, are, are just much easier to understand in a rotating frame. Well we do need to consider the fact that of course with NMR we have different frequencies and so if one frequency is on resonant the other ones are automatically not and that has consequences. So let's have a look at the NAA signal here. Let's say that the, the, the B1 field frequency and the Lamar frequency are identical to each other. That means that the NAA signal is so-called on-resonant. And in that case, the NAA signal nicely rotates around the B1 field and you get a full excitation along the y-axis. If the NAA is on-resonant, that automatically means that the other signals are off-resonant. The frequency of the B1 field and the frequency of, for example, the creatine here at 4 ppm, they are not equal. There is a small difference in this case 243 Hertz so in other words the creatine signal is 243 Hertz off resonance now that will has a, as a consequence that it will be a small uh, field factor along the z-axis equal to that 243 Hertz the B1 is of course along the x-axis together the frequency difference vector and the B1 factor make up an effective field factor be effective. The magnetization no longer rotates around the B1 as was the case for the on resonance condition, but now the magnetization rotates around the effective field. And that has two consequences. First, the magnetization doesn't reach the XY plane, so the flip angle is less than 90 degrees. And furthermore, the magnetization ends up somewhere in the XY plane. In other words, the phase is not zero as it would be along the Y axis. Now, if you do a simulation like this for all frequencies between minus 2.5 kHz and plus 2.5 kHz, you can see that your own resonance at zero, you excite everything to the y-axis. There's no magnetization along the x-axis. If you're a little bit off resonance, either plus or negative, then you're going to get less my, more mx, in other words, the phase is not zero, but also mxy is less so your flip angle is less than 90 degrees and it has a this is could be a problem let's say that your spectrum spans this width then with this excitation profile you're really only exciting you can see that here the creatine and the uh, choline the NAA which is over here is not really excited at all now the only way to solve that with a square RF pulse is to go to a shorter and therefore higher amplitude RF pulse you can see that now the frequency span is twice as wide and now the NMR spectrum is um, you know, much narrower compared to the excitation profile. And now even though the NAA is still not perfectly excited, the situation is already better. In other words, with a square excitation pulse you always want to execute it as short as possible given the maximum allowable amplitude that is available to you. Okay, in summary, signal excitation in NMR is achieved with rotating magnetic fields, not electromagnetic waves as is used in other forms of spectroscopy. RF pulses are always visualized in a rotating frame of reference. And for on resonance uh, spins, the rotation of the magnetization is very simple. It just rotates around the B1 field towards the XY plane. However, when you're off resonance, the rotation is going to be much more complicated because now the magnetization rotates around the effective field, leading to uh, 
lower excitation angles and uh, more phase accumulation. Finally, square RF pulses are the simplest member in a very, very extended RF pulse family tree. Um, there are literally hundreds of uh, different RF pulses that are designed to to have improved frequency profiles, to be less sensitive to experimental imperfections, and we will talk about uh, those in uh, future videos. Uh, uh, there's a few uh, examples uh, and uh, exercises here to get you familiar with calculations of the B1 field in micro Tesla or in Hertz. And finally, if you uh, see me uh, at meetings, this is how I look like. So, you know, come and say hi, or if you have any questions, I'm certainly available for that. You can always email me. Uh, the website is still under construction. And uh, many of the things that I discussed today can also be found in the third edition of, uh, of the book on in vivo NMR spectroscopy.